Hello and welcome to Hartman Talks. My name is Richard Angus and I'm delighted today to be joined by Christopher Robertson of Robertson IP and we're going to be talking about the world of intellectual property. So welcome Christopher, great to have you with us. Thank you very much, it is a pleasure to be here Richard. Right, so I thought what we might do in the next few minutes, we talk, might talk about the background to intellectual property, the types of intellectual property and how do investors basically identify in, the, in intellectual property in a business and then we can take the conversation from there. So over to you. All right, well, thank you very much. So I will start by giving a little bit of background about intellectual property and why we have intellectual property. Um, and fundamentally, there are laws to protect our intellectual property because of fairness and because it's good public policy. So in terms of fairness, I think we've all had a sense from our earliest days in primary school that it's it's not fair if somebody copies something that we have made, something that we have created. And, and that's a very human instinct. And that is absolutely in our legal framework. And that is a large part of why we have that legal framework. But also, it's good public policy to incentivize innovation. If you are protected from having your good ideas stolen by somebody else, then you're investment in coming up with those good ideas in the first place is protected uh, and it's worth making that investment and in terms of consumer confidence of course because a lot of intellectual property is about protecting reputation as much as creativity and it's good if a consumer knows they're buying from the person they think they're buying from so the trademarks are protected uh, and all of that reputation that is contained within that so that's why we have an intellectual property framework in its most basic sense. Um, there are all sorts of different intellectual property rights that are protected by law. The most common of them are patents, of course, which, which many people are familiar with, trademarks, both registered and unregistered, design rights, also registered and unregistered, and copyrights, which in the UK is always unregistered and automatic. So if I take them one at a time and just give a very brief explanation of what they are, a patent, as probably most people know, is an intellectual property right that grants you the monopoly for up to 20 years on the use of an invention, a technical invention, a contribution to technology. Um, uh, they are the most complicated uh, form of intellectual property in many ways, although not necessarily always the most valuable. Um, trademarks. So we start with registered trademarks, which often can be among the most valuable intellectual property assets, particularly for the enormous global brands like Coca-Cola and McDonald's and so on. Um, these are the, this is the legal protection of the get up of your marketing, of your trademarks, your logos, your business names, your taglines and that sort of thing. And, and they can last forever. There is an unregistered option for trademark protection, which is not quite as powerful. And that's all about the goodwill and reputation that you have in those marks as well. Um, moving on to design rights, we have registered and unregistered design rights. They are about the look of your aesthetic product, both in terms of their appearance, uh, uh, in terms of their configuration, their shape, the way they're put together. It's a, a, a narrower right than a patent, and it's not necessarily about a technical product. It's more about an aesthetic product, uh, and they can last up to 25 years for a registered design right and up to 15 years for an unregistered design right. And then copyright protects any literary, dramatic, artistic work, your novels, your films, your pieces of music, your plays, all of that sort of thing. Uh, that automatic it doesn't need to be registered and it can last up to 70 years after the death of the creator. Okay, so um, I think investors are very good at looking at things like earnings and hard assets, etc. But how does an investor identify intellectual property held by a business? Well, it's not always immediately straightforward. So obviously the registered rights there are on searchable databases. And so if an investor knows how to use those searchable databases, then they might be able to identify those rights for themselves at least. But I would really recommend, in fact, hiring a professional to conduct an intellectual property audit of a business if you're interested in learning about the intellectual property of the business. An intellectual property audit will look, yes, it will look at the registered rights that already exist. It will also look at the other intangible assets that might potentially be protectable. But not only that, it will assess 
the the risks associated with them which of these assets are quite strong which are the source of risk for the business um, and it can provide quite a comprehensive report on where that business is up to what policies it follows what policies it needs to follow any contractual obligations elsewhere that might weaken or strengthen its intellectual property portfolio so do many of these intellectual property rights get challenged and if so what are the key areas that you've seen that lead to litigation or potential litigation? So it depends on the, the particular IP right type. So if we talk for to start with about patents, then it's usually about infringement. Um, so if you have a patent for a particular kind of invention and somebody else copies it either deliberately or inadvertently, it doesn't have to be deliberate copy, it could be a coincidental coming up with the same thing, um, then obviously you want to stop them from doing that or you want to insist that they pay you a license for the rights now. It's not usually a straightforward case of one patent, one infringing action, and a case built upon that. Usually the large businesses, uh, the large international corporations have enormous portfolios of patents, all in a very similar technical field, you know, the Googles and the Samsungs of the world. And so it would be very difficult for a new starter in that field to even know what they can and can't do without reading through thousands and thousands of dense legal documents. Um, and so a lot of infringement comes from that and almost the impossibility of avoiding infringement, um, which is why it's so difficult sometimes to get started in some of these very technological fields. Um, trademark infringement is, is another thing altogether. It's not just about the, the coal in the caterpillar and all that sort of thing, which is one of the more famous cases that's been in the media at the moment, but it's, it's about the protection of reputation. And if, the, if, if a big company has invested a lot of money into their reputation, their trademarks, um, they, they don't want anybody else selling similar goods and services to potentially confuse the customer into thinking either this product or service is coming from the big company or the big company is in some way endorsing the products of this company because there's potential reputational damage and potential freeloading from the marketing expenditure of the larger company. So those tend to be at the heart of, of challenges, litigation in, in these fields. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this is obviously a very big topic. What we'd like to do is stop at the moment and maybe talk again in the future about intellectual property value and how investors can basically analyse a company from a slightly different angle than they have traditionally done so. So, Christopher, it's been great to talk to you today. Um, for all our viewers, thank you very much um, for viewing. Please uh, don't forget to subscribe and like. And um, hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Richard.